Um, does this one work? How about this one? Yeah. There you go. Um, this is actually a really good segue, the questions that were just asked. Uh, so before I start, I'll just give you a little bit of an introduction. My name is Yves Lahoz. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of the EOS Network Foundation. We're essentially the stewards of the EOS Network. We were formed last year, about a year and, uh, and two months or so ago, in response to the EOS Networks' lack of development over the last couple of years. So everybody or many people have known of the EOS Network as a very promising layer one that launched in uh, what, essentially four years ago, and it raised the largest ICO in history uh, at $4.1 billion, eclipsing anything else uh, that had ever occurred before and since. So I think the second place is around $150 million. What people don't know is that those funds uh, essentially didn't go to the EOS community. Those funds did not get redeployed. The majority of them are nowhere near uh, that amount got redeployed in the, in the network itself. And so after three years of uh, somewhat inactivity, I mean, there, there were some activities for the first year uh, or two, but as that was declining, the community got together through consensus, through the mechanisms, these, these tools that we're building on the blockchain and reached consensus on forming a foundation. And this is where I come in. Uh, we launched the EOS Network Foundation at the end of August of last year. And for that last year, we've been redeploying tremendous resources back into the network to try and propel that network that had tremendous opportunity and uh, essentially support four years ago back into the limelight. And I'm here to talk about today one of the initiatives in particular that we've been focused on uh, that's actually quite relevant to the questions that were just asked. Uh, because we just talked about hacking, we just talked about what happens when a network doesn't behave, or actually that's the problem, it behaves the way it's supposed to behave because there are errors in code. And a lot of the blockchains that we're building on are based on this premise of code is law. But what we do know in this industry, because we're still so early and because this industry is so nascent, it's not a question of if there's going to be a hack, it's when is the next hack. And so we, uh, in, in, in EOS, uh, through the EOS Network Foundation, Last year, when we began, we invested uh, a lot of resources and brain power into coming up with what we called blue papers. They were academic research in multiple fields, and one of those being an incident response program. So when the network gets hacked or when something happens, when an application deploys code and it doesn't behave the way that they intended it uh, to behave because code People can make mistakes, audits can, can fail, um, open source code can be exploited. What does the network do or what can the network do should it wish to intervene? Because ultimately what we saw, and we have a lot of data on this, especially in 2022, there's a little over $3 billion that were hacked. So if users, ultimately stakeholders, developers, token holders, deploy their time and their energy and their capital into a network, if we want to achieve mass adoption, one of the things that we saw was still missing was what happens when, not if, but when something happened, how can we be positioned as a network to be able to somewhat help foster that mass adoption, make it a little bit easier so that you can have a level of security that's adequate enough and decentralized enough, but that should something occur, the network has a framework, has initiatives, have people and the data required to be able to intervene should they wish to intervene. And in our case, this is what we call Recover Plus. It's essentially an insurance layer on the network that applications can voluntarily participate in that gives them access to the resources should something occur um, to their applications or to their user base. And in the last uh, year, as I said, over 3 billion dollars worth of hacks have occurred and we saw one of them in particular in october that was quite massive when you look at the bnb chain uh binance essentially ended up having to halt uh the the network the chain itself and it was able to limit the losses at roughly 70 million dollars that's still quite a lot that's 70 million dollars that was lost to uh an error of code essentially that's not how the code was supposed to behave uh, and Binance recognized that they halted the network, 
But what that does is that it, it removes a little bit of the confidence in the network because everybody was blocked. The whole network was blocked during that period of time instead of perhaps just one particular application or one particular smart contract. In Binance's case, because they control the validators, they were able to do so roughly you know, efficiently. Again, $70 million lost instead of what could have been, I don't recall the number, I think it was $900 million or so. Um, but they decided to intervene. And we're starting to see more and more of that where networks are trying to find a happy middle between being completely decentralized and not being able to intervene while being completely centralized and not getting those decentralization benefits. And EOS, in our case, we went through uh, a series of events over the last three years whereby some applications were hacked. And the first one occurred uh, roughly a year and a half ago where a vault on chain was hacked and the block producers on the network decided to intervene at that time and they limited the losses. Essentially, all the funds were recovered the hacker was stopped. The hacker apologized even on-chain uh, through signing a, a, a transaction on-chain, essentially releasing all of the private keys, giving authority to the network to intervene retroactively after that was stopped. And we started thinking about how that wasn't necessarily accessible to all. How in that particular instance, the vault that was hacked was run by some of the block producers. It had some people in the network, uh, myself included, that were that had the network, that had the technical know-how to be able to intervene should they wish to do so, that had the network of individuals in order to contact, to be able to perhaps even intervene, and so on and so on. How could we open up that process to others that don't necessarily have that benefit? And what would that look like? So that ultimately, we can increase security on chain and that we can give applications the confidence that should they deploy and should they follow a certain amount of steps, that you might not be able to save everything, but that you might be able to mitigate some of the losses. And that in certain instances, ultimately what that does is it gives a little bit more stability to your user base and it gives a little bit more confidence in this industry of blockchain to those in Web3, looking in and seeing this as a still kind of the Wild West, right? Because it's still very much a nascent field. We have insurance layers in traditional space. We still don't really have insurance layers in the Web3 space. So we started putting resources into this. What would this look like? And that Recover Plus initiative now has been running for a few months. Um, and about a month after the Binance hack, we had another hack that occurred on an application that, which is cross-chain called Panda Rings, and $70 million was essentially hacked. But of that $70 million, there was about $2 million EOS worth of funds that were deployed on the network that EOS itself, through that Recover Plus program, was able to intervene and prevent that $2 million EOS worth of hack from essentially getting to the hands of the hackers. Now, this initiative, obviously, because it's, it's a... It's an opt-in uh, system. There's some information that's required. And what we tried to do with this was to limit the amount of information that needed to be requested from the individuals at the other end and focus a lot of the information, a lot of the work on the applications themselves. So think of it like a B2B, whereas the, the business has to do the B2C, but that business interacts with the protocol to submit information to submit data, to submit the smart contracts, the auditing, the hashes that are related to the auditing, uh, KYC, AML, so that should something occur, the network already has somewhat of a white list of applications that have bought into this program or opted into this program. There's no cost um, to date anyways while it's been running so far, but that they've opted into this program that gives a little bit more insurance to their user base ultimately that should something occur, maybe somebody can intervene. And so as you know, you're talking about DID and you're talking about what happens if the network is, is hacked, we wanted to ensure that going forward, if we want to reach, ma reach mass adoption, we have tools in place, we've got teams in place, we've got resources, and we've got um, some acad academic research in place to start deploying resources whereby in the future, we kind of create an ecosystem so that it's no longer the Wild West. It's no longer 
doggy dog in this blockchain space where code is law. And if something happens, tough luck, it is what it is. Because ultimately, if we want to reach mass adoption, the current way that we're doing things is not really scalable. It doesn't, it works maybe for the people in this room, it works maybe for the nascent players, the nascent developers, the ones that are the, the first movers in this space. But if we want to reach mass adoption, that's not really the way to go. So that's what I want to talk about tonight. And if you've got any questions, feel, please feel free. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Such an insightful step forward leadership that the EOS ecosystem is bringing to us. Uh, so yeah, uh, if any question? Sure. Hello, uh, actually a big uh, fan of you personally, like for saving EOS because the block one is obviously, well, been a bit of pro a pro problematic partner, if I could say. So my if question is, even call them partners. Yeah, it's the, yes. are they planning to sue you or something like this? You never... uh, are they planning to sue me oh. at Block One? Yeah. Or, uh, I don't know. I can't speculate on what they're planning to mm. uh, do or not do. There is, however, a class action uh, lawsuit on the other side of things, right? So without getting into too much detail, um, as I mentioned before, EOS was uh, the largest ICO in history. They raised $4.1 billion. And that went, those funds went to the entity called Block One. And promises and commitments were made that arguably were not delivered upon, that perhaps uh, were the reasons why this was such a successful and, and large ICO. And a lot of people, uh, <laughs> including people in this room, deployed a lot of capital and time into the EOS network with that as a premise that funds would be coming and that resources would be deployed. And so ultimately that didn't pan out. Um, and one of the first actions that we did as the ENF, when the ENF was formed, was to recognize that, to recognize that the consensus was that in fact, Lock One had not lived up to its commitments. And one of the things was that on chain, uh, for a period of 10 years, Lock One was given vesting tokens. So 10% of the tokens for the network over a period of 10 years, and the idea behind that was that over that period of 10 years, it would keep Block One incentivized to keep on building in the network. And we can argue about uh, subjectively how much capital did they, they, they deploy. But one thing is not subjective is when they stopped uh, maintaining and developing the code, it was very easy for people to see. You could see it on GitHub, it went to zero. Uh, that was not subjective. And so when that happened, the ENF was formed. It was one of the main reasons why. And one of the first actions we did was essentially to stop the vesting, or we did not, but the network reached consensus on stopping the vesting uh, through the consensus mechanism so that Block One would no longer get access to future uh, tokens that they had not yet received. Right. I've seen they actually launched bullish exchange valued at $9 billion before launching. Then voice supposed to be social media. But my interest is like, what's the future? So right now you're planning. I read you have like 100 million fund recently launched. And there's also coming EVM for EOS. But what's how do you think actually EOS succeeding? Because right now TVL on EOS is like not even 100 million if you follow DeFi Yama. It's actually more than that, but good. so there are multiple questions in your one question. I'll try to address uh, them in, in order. Um, so you mentioned in terms of kind of what's happening with the or what's going. One of the things um, that we're focused on is game five. And when you look at DAP radar right now, of the top eight different games by daily active users, Antelope, which is EOS IO that was rebranded to Antelope. So the software stack that powers EOS which the foundation funds, develops, and grows, uh, represents roughly 80% of all blockchain daily active users right now in all blockchain. Uh, and so it's quite powerful. This is one of the unfortunate things about EOS and Antelope, the software stack, is that from a tech point of view, it's incredibly powerful, resilient, um, scalable, uh, high throughput, very low cost, very reliable as well. But what was missing in the network was that branding, that marketing, the capital deployment, the partnerships, um, everything that essentially we see other uh, Gen 3 layer one blockchains do very, very effectively. This is what where they had their strengths. And so where EOS is deploying a lot of capital, time and energy is into really focusing on that GameFi side of things. So really positioning EOS as the GameFi blockchain of choice right now statistically through data, it is already the GameFi blockchain or software stack 
um, of choice. So there are multiple blockchains that account for Antelope, the main one being Wax, but Wax and EOS. And so this is really where the position is going. You also then mentioned EVM. So EOS historically did not have EVM. And that was a big, uh, really big uh, crux, especially during DeFi summer, uh, a couple of summers ago, where we saw one of the things that Ethereum did extremely well, despite Ethereum being uh, limited in its scalability, one of the things that Ethereum does extremely well and still does very well is creating an e ecosystem of tools and developers libraries for people to be able to use, right? Reducing that barrier. So sure, you need to jump over that Solidity developer barrier. But once you jump over that, you've got tremendous amount of tools available at your disposal. And EOS couldn't leverage that. And these are basically just doors that EOS could go and open by putting some resources towards making EOS EVM compatible as other layer ones did. So that has been running now on testnet on EOS uh, since last April. And uh, essentially what we've been working on now is making it full RPC compatible through Silkworm integration. And that should be coming out in Q1 of 2023. Um, the current version uh, is full RPC compatible without going into too much de technical detail. It's, um, it's just not as good as what it's going to be with Silkworm integration. And so this is the second part of your question, or I guess comment. Uh, the third part, you mentioned a $100 million EOS fund. So as the ENF, as the EOS Network Foundation, we're a non-for-profit. All of the capital that we get, we get through inflation and we redeploy as we're a non-for-profit back onto the chain. The majority of that obviously goes through as because we're a non-for-profit, goes to public goods, it goes to open source code, it goes to, the, no pun intended, but the foundations of an ecosystem building the, the libraries, the schools, the hospitals, the roads essentially for an ecosystem to be able to to, uh, to be created, to thrive. But what was missing on that is what happens when you start incubating projects and the non-for-profit side of things, the non-equity side of things kind of caps out what comes next. And so over that last year, we've been deploying uh, resources and, and capital through our grant framework program, but that's really limited to about 250,000 to maybe $500,000 uh, grants. At some point, those dApps outgrow that and they need more capital and they're willing to give equity in exchange. But as a non-for-profit, we never really had, or we can't really have the rails to be able to accommodate that. And so we recognized that there was a need for the VC side of things, not simply to, for investments, but also to be able to allow external capital to come into the ecosystem. Right now, the only way that you could invest in the EOS ecosystem would be to buy the EOS token, but that's not a really directed investment. What if you, you are a VC, you want to in, uh, invest in the ecosystem, but you don't necessarily know where to invest, but you want to invest in something in particular, something specific that aligns with your mission and vision. We never really had those rails. Um, there was a thing at the time called the VC, unfortunately, very in ineffective, and we didn't see much capital deployed. And those who have tried to work with them uh, four years ago have a lot of horror stories to tell. But we still recognize that we needed that other side of the coin after those those different pillars that we have, what comes next? And this is where the network uh, issued uh, recently, about a month ago, 68 million tokens, essentially re reissuing tokens that were retired a few years back because they were not being leveraged because they were accumulating in a saving account to start forming the base of a VC fund, essentially, which we call ENV, EOS Network Ventures. Um, and what we're looking to do now is to create the shell around that. So the network has reached consensus on issuing those tokens, on creating that fund. But now really the hard work begins of how do you deploy that capital? How do you create entities around that capital? How do you, how do you create them in a way that ensures accountability towards the token holders? Because essentially this is created by inflation. And how do you ensure that then the capital is then redeployed in the ecosystem effectively to not exit the ecosystem and in a way that actually attracts external capital as well uh, in order to be, a, be able to create more wealth. So yes, this is the $100 million fund um, that, that you mentioned. And was there a fourth part, I think? Antelope. Sorry? Antelope. So Antelope is the software stack that powers EOS. So EOS IO is what the software used to be called. Um, and that rebranded uh, over the course of the, the summer, so just a few months back, to Antelope. And Antelope is essentially was created by four different chains that got together, uh, Wax, Telos, UX, and EOS, that all shared the same software stack, 
recognize the power and the opportunity that lied with that software, that the incredible tech that was there and that had been built over the last couple of years, rebranded it to move away from the past and to invest a lot of resources into making it better as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so maybe I know that there must be some other question, but uh, maybe we can talk about it uh, in the fire chat later. Okay. And so thank you very much. Thank you. If